Hello everyone and welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Vicki St. Clair and I'll be your moderator for the next 60 minutes or so. We're really excited to bring you insights today into Aquent's journey to the cloud. I'm told that as early adopters they flew there long before there were nests. And I guess that's an insider IT joke because it totally flew past me. I'll introduce our guest experts in just a moment, but for those who aren't familiar with Aquent Federal, let me share a little about them. Aquent provides marketing, communications, digital, and design solutions on a global scale. And they've been providing these solutions for some of the world's biggest and best brands for more than 25 years. Aquent Federal partners with the federal government working with agency leaders in strategic communications, marketing outreach, visual information, creative design, and production services. And of course, they work across all platforms and in all media. Uh, just a little housekeeping here. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box as they come to you. I'll make sure we answer them before we wrap up today. And if you do need to leave before the end, that's not a problem. The webcast will be on demand on YouTube, and we'll make sure you get those links. So let me introduce our guest speakers. First, I'd like to welcome Larry Bolick. He's Chief Information Officer of Aquant, and as such, he's responsible for worldwide information technology infrastructure, applications, and support. He has spearheaded multiple acquisition integrations, and in 2010, Larry and his team completed the field office transition to cloud-based services. As well as the amazing accomplishments you can see here, Larry's known for his calm manner and wry sense of humor. He's also very active in the industry, publishing articles and serving in advisory capacities. You might have seen him interviewed uh, around on the, um, online. Uh, joining Larry, we have CTO of Aquins, Zachary Hunter. Um, he has a really interesting background in philosophy and artificial intelligence. That, combined with 17 years of enterprise web app development, has given Zachary unique perspectives and capabilities. He's a technology expert who really understands people and their needs, and he balances that to deliver the perfect solution. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to our speakers, to Larry Bolick and Zachary Hunter. Larry, I know you're going to kick this off, so have fun with it. Thank you very much, Ricky, and thank you to all the folks who are attending today. I'm here on Larry Bullock here in Boston in the Back Bay. Zach Hunter, as you uh, heard, is joining us from Asheville, North Carolina today. Good afternoon, Zach. Good afternoon, Larry. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Aquent, a few years ago, made a strategic decision to move to cloud services. And now we're well into that environment for the last four or five years or so we've been migrating increasingly our operational systems into cloud-based services. We thought given that this audience might find some value in our journey and some of the lessons learned in that journey, some of the mistakes made, some of the um, decisions that were made that actually played out the way we hoped they would play out. So from our perspective in this uh, event today, we'll be going through an agenda that starts with 2008 and where we were then and why we made the decisions we made, the vision that we had for the cloud, and then how that played out, culminating with some additional reading. Some of this has uh, been in the press in the past, so we've consolidated some of those articles and slide presentations uh, here in this presentation for you at the end. The first thing to note is when we made this decision in 2008, it wasn't an IT decision. It was a decision that was made not only with uh, the IT organization, but with the executives that manage Aquin as well. So we all basically had in mind, how do we solve a particular set of problems? And those problems were, we had offices around the world, literally in 15 countries. They were very localized, which is a good thing. They knew the local market very well. But if you walked into one of those offices, their whole universe was within a 50 or 75 mile radius of that office. They didn't have the global perspective of the firm as a whole. They were loosely knit, as the slide here says. So what we were hoping to do is leverage the presence of the firm globally 
to raise the bar and raise the firm from being essentially a federation of local offices to a firm that was, if not global in nature, at least transnational and can function very well across national borders. At the same time, we had an aging infrastructure. We had phone systems that were a decade or more old. We had regional databases associated with client server apps that were regionalized. So if you were in Asia, you used this database. If you were in Europe, you used this database, making uh, essentially creating a lot of friction if you were an agent for Aquin trying to find someone in Europe that you happen to be sitting in Asia. Zach will share a lot more about that particular example uh, coming up. That's a particularly good example of how the cloud has given us some agility in our technical infrastructure. We had other issues as well. So we had client server email systems. We had client uh, software packages on our desktop and laptop machines. Those, uh, in fact, were the number one help desk support item for years. Uh, so the opportunity to move to the cloud gave us an opportunity to actually use the browser as an interface as opposed to client applications, which in one fell swoop at least had the opportunity for us to remove that top listed support item uh, right off the bat. We also had a number of uh, enterprise license renewals that were coming up for us, a 1,000-person firm, relatively large one-time numbers, one-sum numbers. Uh, so the cloud services gave us an opportunity to manage that in a little bit of a different way, which we'll talk about momentarily. But we did have one key advantage in going into this from a cloud perspective, and that was our business back in the 90s had already started turning to be more Internet savvy. We help uh, companies all over the globe build websites. Back, we helped them in the 90s build websites back then. We helped them build responsive websites today. So the business side of our firm already had gained some uh, good facility with Internet services. And it was, uh, I, I think, a key element in helping everyone, IT and the business executives, make the decision to press forward with cloud services, the fact that we had that background. So the vision. We had really three goals in moving forward with cloud services. One was a lower cost base, which I've already alluded to. The second was increased organizational agility, which is a, essentially a, a way of saying we'd like the offices in Asia Pacific to be able to communicate as frictionless as possible with offices in Europe and elsewhere around the globe. And not only communicate, but actually have a day-to-day -day interaction with those offices. So that essentially we're operating as one aquin. If we could do that, that would allow us to operate as a matrix of organizations that might even have practices that instead of focused on local offices, focused on practice areas that spanned multiple offices. And of course, to do all that, we needed to enable global platforms, platforms that were homogeneous in nature so that if, uh, say, I was sitting as I am here in Boston today, but I were in Paris tomorrow, those systems would operate the same in both locations. So I could, in a relatively frictionless way again, just go from one office to another and essentially use the same tools that I have in both places in the exact same way. And if we could do all of that, that would ultimately improve the collaboration across geographies and theoretically at least improve the nature of our business and our ability to grow our business. So why clouds? Well, first of all, the cost model was very attractive. So instead of every three years spending a, a significant amount of money for a license or licenses for enterprise software packages, we could ma manage the cost on a more granular basis. We can manage it monthly, for example. And we can reduce the number of licenses or add the number of licenses on a much more granular monthly basis than we could with those enterprise agreements. 
as I mentioned earlier, we had enterprise agreements imminent uh, coming up when we made this decision. So when we made the decision, we basically uh, did not execute those enterprise licenses and moved ahead with cloud-based services in place of them. I already mentioned the global, the global browser-based accessibility. So instead of client software on our desktops and laptops, we have the ability now to use browsers as the interface. And that enables us to basically keep the browser uh, standardization to a finite set as opposed to all sorts of versions of different client packages that we might need to worry about. We also recognized, because of our Internet uh, expertise on the business side, that there is a rapid pace of inno innovation going on in the Internet, keeping in mind this was back in 2008. And we, as we move forward, we learned that that was not only true, that there was a rapid pace, but that pace is actually accelerating and continues to accelerate today. We'll talk a little bit more about that downstream. We also felt that cloud service providers could act as supplemental resources for us. So for example, in uh, an example of a server, instead of uh, us having to go out, buy the hardware, buy the software, essentially put it all together in our own data center, we could essentially spin up a virtual server in the client space and avoid a lot of the uh, time and effort it takes to actually get a server, especially for those instances where we need some support fairly quickly. Also, and very important in our environment, was that this was a rare opportunity for removing roadblocks. And I think all of us on the call here know that as companies move over time, legacy builds itself into the environment, and legacy is hard to remove. Legacy is software, it's hardware, it's also attitudes, and we had all of that as well. So this was an opportunity for us to remove many of those things and replace them with cloud services, and also start changing some of our legacy attitudes that because we've always done it this way, it has to be done that way. So that was a very big and important uh, revelation for us too as we made these decisions. And then uh, as we thought a little bit more about this, we realized that, you know, all of the services we're about to use, or many of them anyway, are already used on a personal basis by our employees. So if they're supporting themselves on a personal basis, we may actually have the opportunity for them to support themselves at least at a level one basis when we use them internally for business reasons as well. So long list, but lots of thought went behind that question, which is uh, a short two-word question, why clouds? When we made the decision, we undertook multiple programs uh, simultaneously uh, to move many of our infrastructure items to cloud-based services. You can see the M5 networks is a reference to, now it's Shortel via acquisition, but it's a reference to cloud-based voice over IP functionality. In fact, I'm speaking right now over that very service. The idea was remove those legacy phone systems that are in each of our offices and remove the facilities that go with them and essentially move our voice over to our data network. What we also did at the same time, which I'll mention a little bit more in detail shortly, is we also ended up removing our data network in place of virtualized circuits over internet bandwidth. So our MPLS network went away, and as part of that, we moved our voice over to those um, internet circuits that I mentioned earlier. Simultaneously, we moved uh, to Google Apps from our legacy email and document systems. We did that in uh, a way that uh, did a proof of concept in much the same way that you could see we did the proof of concept with the voice systems, starting out with a uh, pilot and then migrating once we were comfortable that that pilot would work, migrating that into larger and larger communities of interest. But very importantly for us, the pilot communities of interest were those folks whom we thought would be early adopters. Once the early adopters said, yes, this will work, they were enthusiastic, 
it was uh, essentially they emanated a gravitational field of enthusiasm and ended up bringing others into the fold. So the rollouts for these were not the simplest things in the world, but from a people perspective, people eventually wanted to be part of this because of that early emphasis on the early adopters who ultimately became the proselytizers for these initiatives. We also did a uh, migration of our custom enterprise resource planning system uh, from internal uh, databases and internal data centers to uh, cloud-based services, in this case, Amazon Web Services. Zach will tell us a lot more about that shortly, so uh, we'll wait for that. And then we had a, a program with a number of other services, some of which were foreseen when we started this migration and some of which weren't. So for example, we knew we would be running our video conferencing over the, uh, the web, but we had really no idea when we started this that ultimately we would be running, as you can see on the right, a log management service for security and performance and other reasons through a cloud-based service. So what that basically is is Sumo Logic. A lot of our operational data flows through Sumo Logic, comes back to us in reports from which we can uh, essentially affect change. We use that for a number of things. As I mentioned, security and performance are the two most prominent. We also didn't foresee that we'd be running security training via a cloud-based service either. And today, for the last year and a half or so, we've been using Wombat Technologies and their cloud-based service in current, uh, to uh, provide uh, training for all of our employees and a good number of our talent as well around things like phishing attacks, how to handle password um, creation, and other security items like that. Now, in terms of the goals that I mentioned earlier, uh, cost was one of them. This is an example from that voice over IP cloud-based uh, rollout that I mentioned. And you can see here that if you look at the orange on the bottom, prior to the rollout, we were spending, this is in the States uh, only, in the United States, spending $70,000 a month on a list of voice-related items ranging from local circuits to facilities to maintenance uh, for cable changes to uh, uh, all the way down to teleconferencing. The data network's included there because that's the baseline that we're comparing uh, our post-rollout environments to. And when we rolled out and uh, completed the rollout, you can see the monthly cost uh, decreased to $39,000 a month, which is about a 45% uh, decrease. One of the interesting things for me personally with this was I, up until this point when we decided to go on this route, I'd always thought that Aquint needed a lot of long distance uh, calling to generate the cost to offset a move to cloud-based VoIP. And that turned out to be incorrect. You can see in this chart, there wasn't really that much long distance calling uh, going on that hit our uh, cost base. But what really uh, incurred costs were the facilities. So trading off the facilities for the service essentially enabled us to eliminate that data network cost and move into an environment that was significantly lower cost for us. So just one example. There are plenty of other examples. I mentioned the enterprise software packages earlier. Uh, those were all multi-six-figure um, contracts for us, uh, a fairly significant sum for us. All of those were essentially turned down in favor of cloud-based services as they come up, came up after this cloud-based decision was made. So think database software, think office software, uh, email software, all of those kinds of things on the enterprise level were moved to cloud-based services. So in terms of agility, uh, we actually increased organizational agility in multiple ways. Uh, I mentioned earlier the practices, and we were able to, once we got into a cloud-based environment, we were able to create practices that spanned offices. So you might remember each office was a localized uh, unit uh, back in 2008. 
Now we have the ability uh, and actually do have practices that span multiple offices. So you can do things now, uh, for example, with hunt groups that span those offices just using cloud-based services. So if we have, say, a toll-free number for a particular practice, say responsive web design, you can dial that number if, uh, the, say, New York office is closed, uh, it's past business hours, someone in the LA office will pick up. So we've ex essentially used cloud services in that example to extend the business day for our clients and for us beyond that 9 to 5 eight to five uh, sort of uh, business day for the local office, just utilizing time zones. As you can imagine, that same sort of thing is very helpful when bad weather arises, snowstorm hits, uh, say, Washington, D.C. That office can have its calls just simply rerouted to, say, Chicago and picked up there. All of that is mapped into our systems uh, in advance. We also uh, uh, have a... Uh, uh, collaboration uh, burst that really surprised me. The collaboration uh, prior to cloud services was a little bit fragmented. We used audio conferencing, uh, actually ReadyTalk, which we're using today. We also used uh, email, lots of email attachments rolling back and forth. But what happened after we moved to the cloud was we found that there were other services that people could very easily use. And today, more often than not, inter-office calls are video uh, more often than they are audio. So people would, uh, instead of just dialing up, people would fire up a, uh, in the Google world a uh, Hangout and have their conference and even one-to-one -one calls video as opposed to audio only. Now I mentioned the uh, location I'm in, which is the uh, Boston office. Our office when you might remember the Boston Marathon bombings of uh, a couple of years ago, our office, uh, headquarters office was actually within the perimeter of the crime scene. So once the tape went up, we couldn't get into our headquarters office. And that tape was up for nine days. So imagine your headquarters being essentially a ghost town for nine days with no one able to get in or out. Because we had moved by that time to cloud services, we had no issues. All of our uh, folks from headquarters basically worked virtually, worked at home, or worked in a different office, and all worked essentially as they do here in the, in the office itself over internet uh, channels. So uh, we did not miss a beat, even with the inaccessibility of our headquarters during that whole episode. Now, I also mentioned the Enterprise Resource Planning System and uh, that being an excellent example of agility in the cloud. And here to help us with that is our CTO, Zach Hunter, as I mentioned, from North Carolina. So, Zach, over to you. Great. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. So, um, as Larry mentioned, I'm going to take the next few minutes here to dive in a little bit about um, the way that agility in the cloud has really expressed itself um, in our organization and how we've been able to leverage it uh, in the development and deployment of our ERP system. So as Larry mentioned, um, for Aquin here, we operate our day-to-day -day, um, business largely through a custom-built web application that we've um, that started its life as a actually just a fat client, I think, um, back in the early 2000s, um, that each, each user would have an installation on their computer. Um, then we turned to a client server architecture. But here, as, as the cloud started to emerge and we were growing um, into the Internet age, we were a web application. Right? So um, it's a standard multi-tiered web application using Java and so forth, as you, as you might imagine. Um, so in 2009, when we really began our migration to the cloud, we were operating um, this web application, as Larry alluded to earlier, in three regions globally, and those regions were siloed. So we had a server, a full stack server infrastructure in Sydney, Australia to service our Asia Pacific operations. We had one in London to service our European operations, and we had one in the Boston area to service North America. Um, 
So these were full um, web application stacks, so web servers, firewalls and load balancers, database servers, all the, um, you know, the physical infrastructure um, to, to implement this, this multi-tiered application that we ran. And as you might imagine, there was a lot that went into maintaining, providing a space co-location services and the networking services for them. Um, as well as the hardware support, operating system support, and all of these things um, that, that we were investing as an organization simply to be able to run these web applications. Um, and as, uh, also, as Larry alluded to, we, we had this opportunity in moving to the cloud to reduce that um, investment and that need, but also to open up more agility, which we'll talk about here, and to, we, we took the opportunity in this occurrence as well to get rid of some of that legacy that we had within the organization, um, both from a technical standpoint as well as a sort of an operational or ad, ad, to, attitudinal standpoint as well. So one of those pieces of legacy was really the fact that these systems were siloed um, and there was no real meaningful interconnectedness between the operations of the business um, in so much as they used these systems. So in 2009, we had these separate systems. By 2011, we were complete with our initial cloud migration. So in this, we actually broadened our footprint globally, as you can see here, to four regional locations, um, the west coast of North America and the east coast. We had one in, a, um, in the UK, and we had moved to I guess, Singapore um, for Asia Pacific operations. These coincide with the location, the physical locations of Amazon um, EC2 or uh, AWS services, in particular EC2 instances and their, their regional data centers. So we took advantage of that and as part of this cloud migration um, also you know, performed the application updates and redesign required not just to move to the cloud but also to support multi-byte um, languages and localization for all of our constituencies as we were growing pretty rapidly at the time in non-English speaking um, areas, particularly in Asia where um, they have ideographic languages, um, and also to institute uh, at the time cutting edge and proprietary as it turns out, um, multi-master data replication so that there was one near real-time um, synchronized set of data, operational data across all of those regions. Um, so that was a big move forward. Um, indeed, even at that time, we renamed our application <laughs> internally to reflect this cloud deployment um, to include the word cloud in the, in the name of our application. So um, really put that forward. And that was really our first step. And we went through many learnings um, you know, uh, about how to deploy these enterprise application systems um, into a cloud infrastructure um, where you have a little bit less control. And um, just a bit as an aside to give you an example of some of the things that we learned um, the way that you would optimize a database server right, for, um, and the disk arrays that you might use for the data partitions for that server, as it turns out, in the Amazon cloud at least, kind of need to do the exact opposite to optimize those as you might otherwise. Um, in particular, spreading the disk activity across multiple volumes and multiple disk arrays. Turns out, since everything in the Amazon cloud works over the same network um, backbone as your internet traffic or network traffic from the server, traditional network traffic, as opposed to a physical server that would have its own disk array backbone, um, fiber channel or what have you, um, that you actually wanted to minimize and reduce the number of volumes being used by your database server. Um, to optimize the throughput for those. So lots of learnings like that as we figured out how to, um, how to make our application infrastructure work in a cloud environment. So by 2011, we had worked through most of that and were pretty well um, ensconced in the, in the cloud and, and operating well. But our agility really came forth then. So um, as you look here in 2012, we wanted to figure out how to improve not only the performance for our end users, but also potentially um, ultimately reduce our footprint in the cloud by doing so. So we did a pilot of um, web application acceleration and network acceleration, so multiple components there with Akamai, one of the leading sort of edge service providers um, and internet acceleration services. Um, 
so we had we we migrated to um, actually Amazon opened up a Tokyo um, location, so we actually migrated there um, as our Asia Pacific operations started to grow more in Japan with the multi-byte support really enabled the growth of that operations, um, and we also tried this application acceleration both between our virtualized data centers on the Amazon cloud, but also to directly to the end user, and. Um, it was interesting. In order to perform that, we had many parallel tests, so we really leveraged the uh, flexibility of the cloud where we could, in a very real sense, bring up an entire exact copy of our full global production um, footprint for a month. <laughs> so we had the ability to continue with our, our, our real live production um, infrastructure and have another copy up that in a traditional environment we would have had to buy the hardware and rent the space and the colocation facilities and invested a, um, so much that it would have been prohibitive really to provide the kind of test but in the web environment the flexibility that provided us we just spun up new instances connected them together and performed these like like um, performance tests and, and throughput tests with the Akamai acceleration and as an aside, while we saw that it did actually perform as advertised, um, turns out the end user benefit or perceived benefit of this web acceleration was not really um, uh, wasn't really material. So while we sped up the network interactions, that wasn't um, the bulk of the user perceived um, speed or performance of the application. So we actually turned that down and ended up not doing it. So we just turned those servers down, and we only paid an incremental. Um, portion of what that production footprint would have cost had we owned it um, and indeed what we did pay for the year for our actual production footprint. So we really got a chance to try something and uh, as is somewhat a mantra in parts of our organization, we failed fast. Um, so you want to be able to have the flexibility to try um, solutions and approaches and uh, many of them won't work out and that's, that's okay as long as you haven't over invested um, in, those, in those opportunities. So. There's a great example of that. And then um, just in this last section here in 2014, um, we actually ended up over time as we began, became more mature and um, optimized our usage of the, um, of the web, of the cloud um, infrastructure that we had, and indeed as our cloud provider uh, grew and improved their services, we have now become able, we limited, um, trimmed down our footprint, turned down our, um, our European and our Asian um, regions. We now are bi-coastal and indeed as a matter of fact as of about 60 days ago we only have one production data center um, with a hot swap replicated standby on the west coast but east coast runs our global application or our global infrastructure um, for all of this uh, enterprise application. And that's largely due to some of just the internet service getting better across the globe and our use of these cloud services sort of requiring our offices and, and upping our bandwidth and so forth, but also it's Amazon stepping up and providing um, better, newer, more powerful um, server instance types to choose from, things that are network optimized and memory optimized which are perfect for our database server and then CPU optimized um, and distributed which is perfect for our application tier. Um, so we're really uh, able to migrate within our cloud infrastructure to new server types, new instance types, essentially replacing what would have been replacing our database um, server with a, a new um, server, you know, with more CPUs, more memory, and all that kind of stuff. But it was really just flipping a switch. Of course, we went through testing and a migration process, um, but we didn't have a, now an old machine that we invested, you know, many, many dollars in that was no longer used, we just turned down that instance and, and migrated our investments over to the new instance type. So that flexibility was really, um, really, really valuable and has allowed us to increase our performance to the end user and, um, and reduce our cost at the same time by taking advantage of the, the growth of these cloud services. Um, another version or take on our agility I'd like to express here a little bit about ways that we've been able to improve not just our topographical footprint and deployment of our application suite but also the 
sort of the functioning of that suite and of those stacks. So we've been able to really leverage cloud services to improve our application release process where in the past, 2009, whenever we'd have an update to our software, it would require an extensive outage, a few hours of our entire application suite that we would do off hours for each of those regional locations. So um, an application release was really a 24-hour <laughs> endurance ordeal for our application support team um, and development team as we would perform our release you know, noon time here in the States for our Asia Pacific folks. So it would be the middle of the night there. And then again uh, in the wee hours, uh, the more late evening for European um, operations and then stay up till you know, the middle of the you know, 4 o'clock in the morning or what have you to perform our release on our North American applications. And, you know, anybody who's on at that time would be interrupted and it was a whole thing. But now, since in order to perform a release, we can just spin up a whole new production application server stack with the new code already deployed behind our firewall and just flip a switch to cut over from one suite of application servers to the other with the new code and then turn the old ones down um, where we wouldn't really have had the luxury to be able to afford a whole duplicate set of servers to, to serve as this sort of swing set, as we call it here, um, that would lay dormant for the vast majority of the time and only be used um, for the day or indeed the, the few hours um, of an application release. So it's really added to um, our, our flexibility operationally as well as sort of the end user experience now this swing, seamless upgrade. Um, similarly, we have an, a very efficient disaster recovery um, infrastructure plan now where we can have servers that are, you know, for instance, our database is a, a hot standby getting um, you know, to the second transactional updates to stay mirrored to our production database server, but it's on a much smaller instance type because there's really no traffic happening other than the influx of these um, echoed transactions for the replication. But we can very quickly upgrade um, that to a production level server um, and the, in the case of a disaster in order to cut our users over to it. But in the meantime, we're paying for a much less expensive instance type within our cloud environment. So really efficient um, from a monetary standpoint, um, disaster recovery environment. We've also been able in, in very similar ways to our, um, you know, to our production release that I kind of described, we have many different environments that we spin up and turn down through with that are non-production environments to facilitate our software development, our custom software development, and our continuous delivery and continuous integration of those as we prepare and move pieces of code through our application development lifecycle. Um, and then finally, we really have the freedom to explore, not just things like our infrastructure in the Akamai web acceleration context, which I described a little bit earlier, um, but we can weave in components and new cloud-based technologies, for instance, Amazon's um, uh, messaging and, and notification queue infrastructure where we no longer have to house our own sort of MQ series or um, anything along those lines, JMX things, so that we don't have to manage infrastructure or applications to, for um, things about messaging services, you know, applicate, you know, business to business or, or computer to computer messaging systems, um, our edge delivery of static resources, we can, we can just flip the switch and try them in our system throughout that continuous delivery environment. And if we like them and they're working out for us, they just go live in production. Um, we don't have to invest um, anything more than our due diligence and development effort um, in, in integrating and then testing that. We don't have to invest in server licenses. We don't have to invest in this um, sort of this long tail of, um, of technology within the cloud. So that's really allowed us to kind of grow and simplify and streamline our development process and add new features to our customers in a really efficient way. So, so in, in all of those senses, I think agility was a goal that we've met and even exceeded, I think, what we might have imagined back when we began this, this cloud migration for the ERP. So Larry, I think I'll add it back to you, throw it back to you now. Thank you, Zach. That was a terrific, I think, example of uh, how we can do things geographically and from a service perspective that we probably couldn't even have envisioned when we went down and made a decision to start on this journey. Well, you might remember we did have that one aquent goal, uh, the third goal, which 
essentially was the ability to move from office to office and function the same as if you were in your home office. And I think for, for, to a large extent, we have achieved that. Um, if um, you move from office to office, the Wi-Fi is the same, the systems that we use on an operational basis are essentially the same. There are some wrinkles still in the fabric. For example, no vendor that we're aware of, at least, provides a global VoIP voice over IP service at this point. So we still have fragmentation with cloud-based uh, voice over IP services. But by and large, all of the other services from email to fax to video to uh, transmission are essentially global in nature and consistent across all of our offices. And that has indeed improved collaboration across geographies, as I mentioned earlier. So we're as likely to see a, uh, a video conference now as we are to see a telephone call. We also uh, have the ability, and this is credit to uh, Google, the ability to build internal websites uh, relatively simply. So all of our users using their own Google account can build a, a website when they have a problem that a website might be useful to solve. Those are, of course, all internal to Aquin, not shared externally. Uh, but that capability exists. So for example, our own intranet is uh, a collection of documents essentially in a uh, Google, uh, uh, Google site format. So if we move on to the question of uh, security, which of course always comes up as it should with cloud-based services, the baseline for security, of course, is you always want to use vendors that you can trust. And one measure of trust is to find vendors who have gone through uh, various certification processes. So with that as a baseline, I think we can argue that from our perspective, our security has actually been enhanced by moving to cloud-based services so aggressively. For one thing, uh, security awareness here is much higher than it's ever been. Uh, so we're very cognizant of patch management. Uh, we're very cognizant of monitoring both who's trying to get in and who's trying to take things out, uh, as well as other monitoring uh, events as well. Cloud-based services provide a lot of security uh, services as well. So for example, we couldn't have imagined uh, two-factor authentication being as simple as it is. Uh, when we started down this road in 2008. I think those of us who were using two-factor back then were basically accustomed to the fobs on the keychain, that sort of thing. Today it's much simpler. And in fact, we've rolled that out uh, across our Google infrastructure for all of our users. We use web filtering that's cloud-based. I mentioned earlier log management here is cl cloud-based. And training is cloud-based as well. I mentioned Wombat earlier with our training uh, uh, program. We also do penetration testing both internally as well as with third parties. Much of that penetration testing is cloud-based as well. So from a security perspective, we have a lot of access to services that we wouldn't necessarily have had when we started down this road in 2008. We probably wouldn't have gone out, for example, and bought a penetration testing tool but now we essentially rent the penetration testing tool from a cloud-based service provider. And in addition to all that, we have those supplemental resources that I mentioned. So not only are Aquint IT professionals actually cognizant of our environment and the security and privacy needs that we have, but so are our cloud service providers. So we have that additional layer of security and comfort that those cloud providers actually provide us. And then finally, lessons learned. From a macro perspective, we think there are really three buckets to consider. One is uh, culture. And I mentioned earlier the idea of finding the early adopters, letting them become your proselytizers, and essentially building that gravitational field that pulls in other users. But we're in a point in time now where millennials are coming to the fore. And millennials, I think as everyone here knows, are very adept at using technology. 
So you can use them not only as early adopters, but you can also trust them to do some self-support and maybe even do some of localized support. Uh, if you're uh, sitting next to a millennial, that's probably a good person to ask a question of before you go to the help desk as an example. But the first bullet in culture is really the overall important one, and that is cloud services are innovating rapidly. As I mentioned earlier, they're accelerating from our perspective. So you have to keep an open mind. If you keep an open mind as to how to use services that you might not have imagined or known about, you can take advantage of services that will make your life easier, make things more efficient, make things more secure. But you have to keep an open mind because cloud services don't necessarily work the same way that you're accustomed to working in a more legacy-oriented environment. So for example, we can, as Zach mentioned, we can spin up a server in 30 minutes because we have an image of the server that we can relate to and just fire up that image and it essentially creates itself. But you have to think ahead to build that image in the way you'd like to have that image create itself. Uh, just one simple example, there are lots of examples of how best to take advantage of cloud services if you're willing to think a little bit out of the legacy box. There's also a process bucket. One of the lessons uh, I learned early on with that example that Zach described for us was that we, when we made the migration to Amazon initially, uh, I tried to too closely engineer the services that we were going to use. And what I mean by that is uh, it was an opportunity where we could have over-engineered those services and then called them down to the appropriate sizing after we made the migration. And instead, what I tried to do is uh, target those services precisely with the migration. And then uh, ultimately what we needed to do was expand the services because we need a better performance than we got initially, whereas we would have avoided that whole problem if we had simply over-engineered it to begin with and then downsized it uh, afterwards. There are occasional outages uh, and some anomalies. So every now and then, and you'll see your email is acting a bit strangely for five minutes or so. Uh, our biggest issue uh, had been a VoIP service outage during the storm Sandy um, episode when Storm Sandy hit Manhattan, it knocked out our primary production switch for telephone services. And the backup switch was not yet online. It was still a couple months uh, in our service provider's uh, facility in Chicago from being brought up. So that knocked phone service out for a day, and not just here in Boston or New York, but across all of North America for us uh, from that one switch. That's one of the downsides of cloud services. That, uh, we survived that, of course, cell phones and uh, other methods by putting a, a toll-free number, for example, on our website uh, with a uh, long-distance provider. But essentially, uh, those sorts of things happen. That's the worst example we can share. That example uh, was about four years or so ago when Stu and Sandy rolled up the coast. And that has since been, of course, rectified. So now we do have a backup uh, facility uh, that uh, hopefully will uh, uh, mitigate the uh, outcomes if we give another storm Sandy come up the coast. One other uh, thing to keep in mind is it's always useful to baseline costs before you make these migrations. So you have a standard by which you can compare your current costs at a point in time to your uh, legacy costs. And you saw an example of that with the voice over IP service chart that I provided a little bit earlier. And then finally under process, there are all sorts of efficiency opportunities that pop up that you may not think about early on uh, when you're starting to think about cloud services. Uh, a good one for us was I had really no idea how many invoices we had from telecom vendors until we rolled out the VoIP services and started turning all of those services down. And each of those invoices, of course, this is back in 2009 or so, came in in paper, uh, 
Uh, so we're dealing with literally scores every month of paper invoices from different telephone uh, companies all over the place. Similar sort of scenario, but not quite as extreme with our computer and colo providers. But you can see the, the, the impact of that. So those scores of invoices now have essentially come down to a single invoice on the telephone side of our uh, operations in North America. And then the third bucket, of course, is security. If you're entrusting your data and your systems to a third party in the cloud, you certainly want to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that that is a trustworthy partner. But there are other things to consider as well. Uh, one is cloud-based services are accessible from lots of different places, not just your offices. So it's important to focus on the weak points in that whole relationship. And often those weak, weak points are employees. So we spend a lot of our time and have spent a lot of time training employees as to what a phishing attack is, testing them with phishing attacks, dropping flash drives in the lobbies of offices as we visit offices just to uh, make sure that employees are aware that that's a, that's a malware potential item that they're uh, attempting to plug in. Uh, lots and lots of effort around employees. One of my favorite stories now is we, we uh, did so much phishing training with our employees that now when we send out uh, an email from the IT organization that might be a, an out of normal, an atypical sort of email, it's not too long before someone emails me and, or calls me or walks by and says, hey, I got this email that's kind of unusual. Uh, should I open it? Uh, so it's actually kind of gratifying to, to get those uh, responses when that sort of thing happens. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier uh, cloud services. There are lots and lots of uh, security-oriented cloud services that are coming online now. Uh, we never would have uh, instituted two-factor uh, in our legacy environment. And as I mentioned earlier, for example, two-factor is what pretty much every, every employee now uses to access uh, company email. That's just one example. There are plenty of others. We could go on and on uh, like this for a lot longer than we have, but uh, what I would like to point you to is some additional reading. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, a lot of this, as we were, uh, were going through it, was chronicled in the press. So we captured a few of those articles here. There are a couple of slide decks from various talks we've given at conferences uh, along the way. So you're welcome to look at those. And by all means, uh, if uh, any questions, feel free to uh, contact us. So with that, Vicki, I will turn this back over to you. Well, thank you, Larry. Boy, you guys gave some great information out here, um, some really terrific tips and best practices. Um, I've heard you talk, Larry, about uh, calculated risk management and how important that is to achieving success. And I'm wondering how that changed over the course of the migration. Well, uh, why don't I start, and I'm sure Zach has uh, perspectives from his uh, uh, position as well, with the, uh, especially with the uh, CloudWall uh, application that he mentioned earlier. When we rolled into this uh, CloudWall migration, Vicki, we essentially started with the idea that we would have a handful of trusted partners that were fully certified. We could uh, essentially rely on the fact that they were certified. Uh, we would start with a proof of concept so we would gauge early on where weak points might be uh, and then move on from there. Even with that sort of mindset, we ran into issues that popped up that were unforeseen. One example uh, comes to mind in the uh, Google world, for example, where uh, Google actually notified us, uh, I believe it was over a weekend, that one of our accounts had been accessed from Jakarta. And we didn't really have an office at the time in Jakarta, or nor did we know of anyone who was traveling to Jakarta. So what had happened was, before we had two-factor in place, one of our email accounts had been cracked. And that's when we really started thinking, you know, this is uh, something we ought to really uh, uh, emphasize is the two-factor authentication. and that. That incident was really the catalyst for pushing us into the two-factor world, which we've been in now for a couple of years. Zach, any other thoughts to add to that question? 
Sure. Yeah. I think um, <laughs> it's interesting because uh, sort of you're learning, Larry, a little bit that you mentioned earlier about um, starting big and ramping down with our, our services. There's, um, yeah, I think that's, that's something that's really baked in now to our calculated risks, if you will, um, because we do, we, we, because it's so easy to turn things on and off to ramp up and ramp down within our infrastructure, I think um, we can uh, avoid risks, I suppose. So a little bit different than, um, than risk taking, but sort of the calculating part, I suppose, um, because the risk of over-investing, I suppose, is so small um, when you can find out that, all right, well, after four weeks, we're actually only at 30% capacity of these four servers, so let's get rid of one of them. Um, and save ourselves the cost. So I think, um, I think we found ourselves um, really leveraging that. Um, it's a little bit of a different take on it, but from an optimization right. standpoint. But. Right. Yeah. Now, um, for those in the government, drafting an RFP can be a very lengthy process, I understand. Did you make your buying decision uh, using an RFP? And if so, would you write it differently? Would you, would you share some insight on, on that? That's a, an interesting question. I mean, we need to take the time frame into account, uh, Vicki, when this was all initiated. It was very early in the cloud-based uh, days. So for example, there was no uh, Microsoft Azure. Right? That wasn't even coined yet as far as uh, we knew. Uh, the cloud market was very fragmented at the time. So we did not use an RFP for some of our cloud-based services. What we did do was we leveraged what we knew about those services from folks who are, were already using them for various purposes. So for example, we have developers in our space who were using uh, Amazon for various purposes for code development. Uh, we already knew uh, a little bit about Google from personal accounts, that sort of thing. So the, uh, at the time, the vendor environment wasn't robust enough that we would have actually uh, entrusted more than a handful of vendors that we already knew. That's changed. So if we were doing this today, we would certainly go uh, the RFP route and I think make it a much more formal process. But back then, it was essentially a handful of vendors we trusted. We started working slowly with them and just basically that trust grew. Right, right. Well, believe it or not, we're almost at the end of our hour here. It flew by, but I, I think this is an important question to get in. And um, maybe you can both answer this. Um, I, I've heard you talk, Larry, before about managing a shifting IT workforce as being one of the biggest challenges when you're going through this. Uh, transition. So I wonder if you'd share your top two tips with us. Well, uh, I'll, my top tip, let me give you my top one and maybe Zach will give you uh, uh, a top tip as well. My top tip is that uh, the fear factor can be turned into a career opportunity. And that's early on in the um, uh, Amazon days. We took system engineers who were accustomed to working with you know, pick your vendor hardware and basically said to them, uh, why don't you learn how to use a virtual uh, service for doing that very thing? Uh, you know, some of them were reluctant and some of them took to it like a fish to water. So the important thing I think from, that I took from that is the staff can be positioned or the, the uh, cloud services can be positioned and should be positioned as an opportunity for staff, not as a replacement or a fear factor for staff. Right. And Zach, do you have a, do you have a top tip you'd like to share on that going through your experience? Sure. Well, I, I can say this in the, in the software development field, it's a competitive marketplace to, to try and um, hire people these days. And that ebbs and flows, of course. But I've actually found our use of the cloud, um, as well as this is a bit of an aside, but open source technologies, um, but a lot of these, these newer cloud platforms and cloud technologies is a real selling point to recruit, um, matter of fact. So there are companies out there that um, you know, might be hard to attract a younger, up-and-coming, sort of more um, 
uh, exuberant and technically savvy, productive type people, um, they're, they're excited to work in these new technologies and in cloud, cloud infrastructures and cloud platforms because that's, that's where all the buzz is these days. So um, I think that could be an opportunity for recruiting as well. Yeah, it does sound like a lot of opportunity. Well, I have to thank you both very much, Larry Bolick and Zachary Hunter. Thank you so much for uh, taking time to talk with us today and share your journey uh, taking Aquant to the cloud. I think it's, you've shared some really valuable information and uh, very much appreciate it. Well, thank you for the invite. Yes, thank you. Um, before we head out today, I want to, you might be wondering, how, so how do we work with Aquant Federal? And there are several ways that you can do that. You can see here there are contracting vehicles listed on this slide. Uh, there's also a link at the bottom of this slide which shows you a direct link to the web page that has all the contracting vehicles on. And uh, it's a very simple process, and the person that's going to make it very simple for you is this person, Leanne Drew. She's Vice President of Aquant Federal. She's been in this business a long time. She knows it inside out. She's very approachable. Her full contact information is here. So if you have any questions about today's presentation, any questions about what Aquant Federal does or where it might fit into uh, helping you achieve your goals, then uh, please get in touch with Lee. I want to thank each of you for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate you being with us. If you enjoyed today's presentation, it will go up on ReadyTalk for about 30 days, and it will stay up on uh, YouTube, so it will be available. If you want to tell uh, your colleagues and coworkers where they can find it, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great day.